Okay, we're going to get started. We may be joined by Council Member Trayon White, but I want to be respectful of the time for those who are here already. Good afternoon. I'm Brianne Nadeau, Council Member for Ward 1 and Chairperson of the Council's Committee on Public Works and Operations. Today is Monday, March 18th, 2024, and I'm calling to order this virtual meeting of the committee on the Zoom platform. The time is 1.33 p.m. For the record, I'd like to note we have a quorum consisting of Chairman Phil Mendelson, Council Member Lewis George, and myself. Today, the committee will consider and vote on two measures. B25-469, the Revised Project Labor Agreement Cost Threshold Amendment Act of 2024. B25-151, the Open Movie Captioning Requirement Act of 2024. The first bill we will consider is B25-469, the Revised Project Labor Agreement Cost Threshold Amendment Act of 2024. B25-469 was introduced by Chairman Mendelson on September 18th, 2023, and is referred to the Committee on Public Works and Operations with some comments from the Committee on Executive Administration and Labor. This bill was first introduced in Council Period 24 as B24-999 and received a robust public hearing in November of 2022. Because of this, an additional public hearing on this bill was not required in this Council Period. B25-469 amends the Procurement Practices Reform Act of 2010 to revise the cost threshold for the required use of project labor agreements on construction contracts from 75 million to 50 million. A project labor agreement is an agreement with one or more labor organizations that establishes the terms and conditions of employment for a specific construction project. As a condition of being awarded a contract, the contractor must sign the negotiated PLA with any relevant union organizations. In return, labor strikes and similar disruptions are prohibited. This in turn ensures labor peace on high cost government projects. PLAs are accepted policy in the district. In 2016, the council unanimously adopted the Procurement Integrity Transparency and Accountability Amendment Act of 2015, which included a provision that construction projects with an anticipated value of $75 million or more include a PLA. Since then, they have demonstrated their benefits on numerous projects. While the committee has taken all viewpoints into account, I believe that claims that this bill will harm local construction firms, CBEs, and minority-owned firms are unfounded. PLAs typically include mentoring programs for small local and minority contractors to help them grow their businesses. PLAs also often include smaller bid packages not subject to the PLA to ensure small local and minority business participation. Many small local and women-owned businesses have no issue working on PLA projects. As an example, the Frederick Douglass Bridge was the largest infrastructure project in the district's history and was completed one month ahead of schedule and included at least 45 minority and women-owned businesses representing $91 million in contracting opportunities. Another example is the Benjamin Banneker High School Project, which won the Engineering News Records Best K-12 Project of the Year in 2022. Built on time and on budget, the project saw no lost time accidents during nearly 400,000 400, work hours. It also complied with the district's stringent local hiring requirements and participation requirements for certified local small and disadvantaged business participation. And one final example, in its pilot asbestos removal project with Lyuna and the Prince George's County Board of Education, the board's report shows that 63 workers employed, 98% were minorities. 58% of the workers were, were residents of Prince George's County, which was their project. Also of note, 56% were female. I want to emphasize that all district government construction projects are required to comply with the district's CBE and SBE laws, regardless of whether a PLA is in place. And the aforementioned projects demonstrate that PLAs have positive effects on project outcomes, while still being inclusive of small minority and women-owned businesses. PLAs are also accepted policy at the federal level. On February 4th, 2022, President Joe Biden issued an executive order requiring PLAs on federal construction projects. The project cost threshold set by this executive order was $35 million. The White House noted that the order has the potential to affect $262 billion in federal government construction contracting and enhance job prospects for close to 200,000 workers. The new federal PLA requirement <clears throat> is also brought to alleviate, thought to alleviate coordination challenges on large complex projects 
raise quality standards for contractors bidding on federal projects, and reduce uncertainty in the contracting process by standardizing the work rules, compensation costs, and dispute settlement processes on construction projects. This bill brings the district in alignment with federal policy. The committee made a minor technical change to the effective date language to ensure it was in line with the effective date requirements of permanent legislation rather than emergency measures. The committee also struck the language to the district from the existing law to ensure that the PLA requirement applies to all district projects that meet the monetary threshold, regardless of whether that threshold is met solely with district funding or includes federal funding. I firmly believe that the legislation will expand opportunities for the use of a mechanism that has already paid dividends for district residents and has the potential to provide even more. The committee therefore recommends the council approve B25-469. Is there any discussion on the report or the print for B25-469? I'm gonna say something if my colleague doesn't. Um, Councilmember Nadeau, Chairman Nadeau, I appreciate you moving forward with this legislation. You said near the end of your statement that this brings us in alignment with the federal government, but you also noted that the executive order is at $35 million for the federal pro for federal government projects, and this bill is at $50 million. The uh, legislation, which was adopted a number of years ago, setting the threshold at $75 million, was set at $75 million solely because of the fiscal impact issues that the chief financial officer alleged. I continue to disagree with the chief financial officer's assessment because I think it is easy and, uh, what do I want to say, urban myth that PLAs are more expensive. And the CFO seem to fall in line with that. Uh, what I believe we've seen with projects that have had PLAs in the district, I think the convention center was a PLA, but not positive. I didn't do the research. And I think the state national stadium was a PLA. Generally, these projects seem to come under budget and on time, uh, which argues against their having a fiscal impact. Um, I think the greatest reason or the biggest reason for opposition to this legislation is that uh, organizations that contractors, for example, who don't like unions, resent that there might be a PLA on a project where they don't wanna to have to work with the union. But that, in my view, is not a good reason because what this is about is labor peace, as well as ensuring that there is um, a project that has good chance of getting completed, getting completed on time and even under budget with this legislation. I have to say, I think your statement really covered the field, and I had to struggle a bit here to add to it, but I wanted to uh, indicate my support, so thank you. Thank you, Chairman. It's great to have you here with us today in the committee. Okay. Um, hearing no additional discussion, all those in favor, I move to I move the to approve the committee print and accompanying report for B25-469 with leave for staff to make technical and conforming changes. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Chairman, did you vote? I did. I said aye. Oh, very good. Okay. Thank I you. I said aye first. Oh, I am so sorry. I'm very glad that I clarified. Um, okay, uh, the vote is unanimous. And next we will consider B25-151, the Open Movie Captioning Requirement Act of 2024. B25-151 was introduced on February 23rd, 2023 by Council Member Charles Allen, along with Council Members Fruman, Henderson, Lewis, George, Nadeau, Parker, Pinto, and Robert White. It was initially referred to the Committee of the Whole and re was re-referred to the Committee on Public Works and Operations, June 6th, 2023. The bill establishes minimum requirements for open, open caption showing at movie theaters and requires that a certain number of these showings be during peak weekend hours. This is the fourth introduction of similar legislation led by Council Member Allen, and I'm proud to finally be moving forward on this bill that is so important to so many. The U.S. Department of Justice finalized a rule in 2016 outlining that movie theaters are required to provide closed movie captioning wherever requested. While this is an important accessibility measure, a significant motivation for the introduction of B25-151 and its community support is a strong dissatisfaction with the experience of using closed captioning devices in theaters due to malfunctions, discomfort, or a general feeling of exclusion and othering. 
The District of Columbia has one of the largest communities of deaf, hard of hearing, and late deafened res residents in the world. We should choose to be a leader in accessibility in public spaces. I'm pleased to be able to say that after ex extensive collaboration with advocates and the local movie theater industry, this committee print has gained approval from both parties. The print builds on existing open captioning offerings by requiring three showings per week in the first two operating weeks of a movie's release with two per week in each following week. At least one showing per week must be during peak hours on Friday evenings, Saturdays, or Sundays. These are discrete requirements as opposed to the bill as introduced, which used a percentage-based standard. After working with theaters and understanding how the job of a theater manager works day to day, we came to agree with them that basing the requirement on percentages would be incredibly challenging for theaters to comply with and likely result in unintended violations. Section 2C of the committee report goes into detail on how we arrived at the language in the print. By structuring the requirements in this bill in a way that fits in with how theaters do their scheduling, we believe that compliance should be easy to follow and set expectations for theaters and moviegoers alike. The other significant change from B25-151 as introduced is an overhaul of the enforcement mechanisms. The bill as introduced would have had the Office of Human Rights enforcing under the DC Human Rights Act. While this makes sense on its face, it became clear that the typical adjudicatory procedures for OHR enforcement would not appropriately address this industry or the types of violations in question. Customers should not have to wait weeks or months for OHR to come to a determination on a violation, and theaters should not be burdened with a lengthy adjudication process if it's not necessary. After working extensively with OHR, the committee print includes a monitoring and enforcement scheme that is tailor fit to how movie theaters work and that can move at a more appropriate speed. OHR is empowered to conduct random compliance reviews to ensure that theater schedules match the law's requirement. They would be required to conduct at least three reviews per theater per year. There's also a consumer reporting portal to support compliance monitoring. If a theater is found not to be in compliance, there's a remedy process rather than a simple fine. OHR is authorized to order a theater to add additional caption showings within the following operating week proportional to the infraction. This immediately rectifies the violation and serves as a strong enough disincentive for a theater. That said, because we structured the requirements the way we have, I believe that OHR's use of this remedy will be very rare. In New York City, the closest peer jurisdiction that already has open captioning requirements, they have yet to receive a single substantiated complaint through their consumer portal. The committee print makes some smaller changes and additions to the bill as introduced. The requirement for individual theaters to advertise showings is removed since the advertising is largely done by studios and distributors. This is replaced by an expanded public information campaign to be conducted by the Mayor's Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. The print also makes local movie theaters eligible for the district's local film incentive grants in recognition of the current economic uncertainty of the industry that the, and the potential need for theaters to update procedures and technology to comply with the law. With that, the committee recommends the council approve B25-151. Is there any discussion on the report or print? Yeah. Council member Lewis George. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Nadeau. Today I'm voting in favor of B25-0151, the Open Movie Captioning Requirement Act of 2024. As chair of the committee and on facilities and family services, which has oversight over the district's disability-related agencies, including the Mayor's Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, ensuring the District of Columbia is as accessible as possible to both residents and visitors is a top priority for me. Going to the movies is a simple and fun activity many district residents and visitors enjoy with friends and family, yet far too many are unable to partake in this experience because far too many film showings are not accessible to people who rely on captioning. Currently, open captions are available only for a few select showings that are often at inconvenient times when people don't usually go to the movies. The Open Movie Captioning Requirement Act not only established requirements for showing films with open captions, but also creates an effective enforcement mechanism that empowers the Office of Human Rights to conduct proactive inspections of theaters and imposes consequences for theaters who fail to comply. I want to thank Councilmember Allen for introducing this bill um, and members, especially members of the deaf, deaf blind, latent deaf, deaf disabled, and hard of hearing community for their advocacy in support of this bill, specifically and their advocacy overall for making the District of Columbia as accessible as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember, and thank you for all your hard work with the Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I look forward to future collaborations. Uh, if I may, I'll Certainly. say some more. So I will be voting in support of this as well. 
Uh, when the bill was originally introduced many, many years ago, it was in the committee that I chair, and we had a hearing. I had some concern about the uh, effect on the movie theater industry, and I'm going to ask you about that in a second. And with the pandemic and all the challenges that the movie theater industry had, like mainly they couldn't operate for a couple of years, it was not a good time to be passing this legislation. So I'm glad it's moving forward now. A few years ago, when we had the bill in my committee, um, the only jurisdiction that had this was Hawaii. And I remember actually talking with the senator from Hawaii at a conference of the National Conference of State Legislators, who commented that the industry really talked very much against this bill, but in fact, the experience in Hawaii was not negative. Uh, I will add that uh, I have noticed that since, since this legislation was first introduced, I pay a little bit more attention to captioning. And there are a whole lot of people, including younger people, who actually want sometimes to see captions because it's easier to follow the dialogue when there are a lot of other distractions or the dialogue on the screen is um, not as clear. And uh, so captioning, I think, is um, something that's more... Uh, um, afraid of then is actually a problem. And I think we will see that as this is implemented. Could you say a bit more about, you said that you have support from the um, local movie theaters? We worked extensively with them. Um, we essentially brought them to a neutral position, um, which I think is a victory given the fact that there was a great deal of opposition from the beginning. And, and we did, refer back to your hearing, we um, will be including that hearing record um, with our report as well, because we thought it was really important context. You're right, a great deal of time has transpired. And that um, experience from Hawaii was interesting in particular because there was this very scary report that came out of Hawaii about the impact it would have on um, movie patrons. Um, and so we reached out to the office in Hawaii that did that report um, to kind of do a fact check and concluded that it was really just an overestimate and was not what bore out on the ground. So um, I think we're in a good place. You know, we, um, there are a handful of movie theaters in the District of Columbia. We want to see them thrive. We want people who attend movies in the district also to be fully supported. And I'm with you. I'm what one might consider a younger person on the spectrum of moviegoers. Maybe not. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, being too kind to myself, but um, I do like having those captions up there. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that do. Um, so I think we're in a pretty good place. So, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and we have been joined by the Ward 8 Council Member um, Treyon White. We are, um, Council Member, we are um, discussing Bill 25-151 which is the open um, captioning bill for the movie theaters before we move to a vote. If there's anything you want to add? Not at the moment, Chairwoman. No problem. Okay, so hearing no additional discussion, I move to approve the committee print and accompanying report for B25-151 with leave for staff to make technical and conforming changes. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Excellent. The vote is unanimous. Is there any other business before the committee? Okay. Hearing none, the time is 1.52 p.m. and this meeting of the Committee on Public Works and Operations is adjourned. Thank you everybody for joining.